So all the material, the slides and so on, you are free to share after the tutorial. So you got the software, you got the slides with it, and these slides you can share to colleagues. You are very welcome to do that. Uh, the agenda, roughly, is that we present a general motivation overview. This is not really a tutorial, this is a more presentation for you to understand what EFMI is about and to see a few things we will later demonstrate. That presentation will be done by Oliver Lennart from Bosch and myself. And then we uh, present you a running use case we want to use in the tutorial, uh, which we think is very exemplifying the EFMI and why it is good and what you can use it for. And after this use case presentation by Oliver, we will have the hands-on in Daimola. And for that, you need a software we provided to you via the download link. And I will hand over to Oliver already, because he can present with the motivation. Okay, yeah. All right, yeah, so my name is uh, Oliver Leonard. Yeah, and I'm uh, quite happy also to present uh, EFMI to you. I mean, uh, describing the motivation of EFMI, that feels like uh, kind of going a couple of years back when I was leading the emphasis, the European publicly funded uh, ITEA project, which um, uh, developed the EFMI standard. Because then I had to explain over and over what EFMI is about, so I will do it once more. But now the good news is there's much more coming, uh, and you will see and uh, try it out by yourself. And uh, what has also changed uh, since uh, the end of the emphasis project is that the um, copyright of the EFMI specification has been handed over to the Modelica Association. And the Modelica Association decided that there shall be a, mo a new Modelica Association project, EFMI, and thankfully, uh, Christoph Burger took over uh, leading this uh, project and really pushed it forward, also supported by the deputy leader, uh, Hubertus. Um, and the other good news is that on this slide you will find a lot of logos of partners from the prior emphasis project, but there are also new partners. Um, and, uh, and this is also quite nice to see that uh, the community is growing and we really are uh, uh, yeah, excited to present this here and this audience really trying to propel uh, this whole process and to accelerate it even more. So, but now what is EFMI? What is this all about? And um, I think it's best explained by a, a tiny example and what we see here in the upper right is some process that is supposed to be controlled. And of course, uh, in this control function, you have to have some sensor signal in order to compute something meaningful as output that is then used as input into the process. But I mean, we wouldn't be here at the Modelica conference if we were not somehow dealing with modeling uh, systems. And in particular, physically modeling it. That means we have a good understanding of the uh, basic uh, laws of physics that um, dominate this system. And having that knowledge is really an, an enabler to make not just some process model, but a really physical uh, model that is able to allow to predict uh, the behavior uh, also of complex systems. And this then, if you are able to make this process model as a virtual sensor part of your function, then of course you could even get rid of the real sensor or you could control systems where you don't have certain sensors because you cannot measure everything. And you could also do all kinds of other uh, model-based approaches in control theory and really take advantage of this uh, knowledge. So you may ask yourself, well, modeling, model exchange, I mean, that's an old story. I mean, we have FMI uh, around for, for years now, um, and that's also a common practice. 
to build a model in some more physics-related environment and export this as FMU and run it in some other more control-oriented uh, environment. So what, what is uh, so new about this uh, general idea? And what I want to uh, really um, illustrate in the slide that FMI is really more about co-simulation. So you plug together uh, models from different domains coming from different uh, simulation tools and then you might have some, some orchestration, co-simulation environment making sure that all this uh, works stable. But in, with eFMI you're really addressing the control, model-based control and the software engineering part. And that's often underestimated what that actually means. So it's really about saying, I might take a, a small subset, maybe a, a plant model that I have, maybe in combination with some controller, and wrap it into an EFMU so that I can really integrate it into my automotive software or whatever uh, software environment I have, satisfying also real-time constraints and being capable to be used as a safety critical software. And that's of course a, a big difference. And here on this slide we have summarized what is different running a piece of software on an embedded controller versus running a simulation on your PC. Because you have uh, much weaker uh, uh, processors, uh, you are limited in, in memory. I mean, that's really something that we don't even think about when we hit the simulate button, how much memory is allocated. Uh, you will start thinking about this, this if you are, have the job to provide an embedded software. So then you start counting uh, bits and bytes to make it uh, small and compact. And then you have to live with uh, uh, tight sampling rates and the memory has to be allocated uh, statically. And uh, most of all, you have to guarantee the execution time. So you have your slide, slide um, time slot and you have to stick with it. And, um, and this has uh, hard consequences. So that means you cannot run a decimal solver on an ECU. I mean, first, it's just, uh, I don't know how many uh, libraries this will pull in that are simply not available but then it will take a lot, a lot of, amount of uh, memory and allocate dynamically and then you have iterations going on where you never know how long the next step is going to take. So all this has to be um, guaranteed to work always. And therefore it's kind of obvious that we need something new and also it should become very clear that this is not easy. So. I mean, we are familiar with physics modeling uh, and what it takes, so that's difficult enough. Combining this with control engineering makes it even harder. But then, as I mentioned, you might have to live with a processor that has uh, single precision. What does that mean for the robustness of this code? And then all the rules and regulations come in that you have to satisfy and deal with otherwise your software will not be uh, accepted. And this is where really the MISRA rules uh, are just one example of potential regulations you have to meet. So code quality is also a big concern. So to cover all this by one function developer, I mean you probably need some superhero type of uh, function developer to do that in a decent way. And um, I mean there are these type of people that manage that but we don't typically have plenty of them. So this doesn't really scale and that in other words means if we want to use model based approaches more widely then we should think about how to could we simplify this process. How can we separate the concerns? and say, well, we have experts in each and every field and they have their own preferred tools. So how could we design a workflow to combine all that, to foster that they can cooperate? And this is really what motivated EFMI to play this role. 
so that at the end, people will be more happy and that we need fewer superheroes. And this is really the, the whole idea of EFMI being a container architecture that is kind of floating in between these different phases where you do modeling and where we have like this uh, open workspace where everybody can contribute his part and can also live a very flexible, even iterative workflow. So this is why EFMI has become a, a standard and has evolved uh, as an open standard. But what is EFMI now? After all this talk about safety critical, real-time targets and so on. So as I already mentioned, the idea is to provide a, a workspace that can be used in a stepwise procedure. And also, it's about supporting implementation, testing, and integration. And how is this done? So there are multiple containers. So one is the behavioral model container, and this is representing the behavior, how the software was originally created. So it's a reference solution that you can use in an end-to-end -end testing scenario to make sure that what you get out at the end behaves in the same way as the thing that you have designed initially. Then there is this algorithm code container, and this is really the algorithmic solution. And that's why this GALEC, this Guarded Algorithmic Language for Embedded Control, has been uh, developed in order to have a, a, a language that is target independent. So that can describe what is supposed to be computed on a high level. And then we have uh, the production code container where it really becomes target specific. But here also lies a big difference to FMI that this production code container, there can be multiple of them. And this is also gives the, the freedom to say, I have the same algorithm, but I have multiple targets, and I have different optimizations for the different purposes, but I can keep them all together in one overall structure. And then finally, the binary uh, code representation, which is another container uh, where you can already have um, the binary to, uh, for, for being distributed, but also here, it's more than just the binaries, it's in fact the build recipe. So all uh, related information that you need to, uh, to create this and integrate this, bin these binaries. And this is, in uh, simple ways, how this EFMU uh, looks like. Um, a core idea is to have these manifest files. So we have one manifest that's like the content description of the entire EFMU. Then we have like these pillars of these different containers. And each and every container has its own manifest file in itself. And this is also a quite interesting um, concept because the production code has a manifest that describes how to integrate the interface. From FMI, we know that the interface is standardized, it's fixed. So if you want to use an FMU, you read the specification, then you know how to, uh, how to import it. But for embedded devices, for embedded functions, it's so dependent on what you want to do with this function, what environment you want to integrate it with, that it would be a very restrictive assumption to make to say you have to implement the interface in this way. You have to pass these variables by value or by reference or by a struct. I mean, we wouldn't know how we should have standardized this and therefore we decided to have a manifest. So if you import it, you look into the manifest and there you see what type of function is implemented in which way. And this will tell you how to integrate it. And this gives really maximum uh, flexibility uh, for various um, targets. 
So how does this then look in a more workflow fashion? So starting from uh, a model that you have, um, you use a modeling tool that is capable of generating an EFMU. And the very first thing that you might think of, even though it's an optional thing to have, um, is that you define a test case that produces a reference result for you for the block that you want to uh, export into this EFMU. And this is the behavior model container. The second thing is that you then uh, take your model and that this is transformed and translated in an algorithm in this target independent language uh, garlic, which is then stored in this algorithm container. And then you bring in uh, and a different tooling. So because now we are no longer talking about the guy who created the model and processed it, now we're talking about the guy who's really concerned about the software. So he brings in his code generator. He knows how to configure this code generator to have really optimal code for his target. And then he will use his tooling, and here we have the CATIA ESP and, and target link uh, on the slide to generate production code. And you can even have multiple of them if you want to. And then, of course, you might already have uh, the idea of um, integrating this. And here's only one example, the Autosar Builder, where you can already compile it into an uh, Autosar software component. I think Target Link has a similar functionality where you can do uh, uh, things like that. And then you can also, on top of that, store this in the same overall container architecture. As we go forward now towards integration, you now can bring in even another set of tools that is able to read the EFMU. And one important step, as I uh, um, uh, said at the beginning, is code quality. And there are dedicated tools for instance, the, the Astray uh, tool that is doing static code analysis. And they have a tooling to read this EFMU where you can decide which production code you want to check. And then you will uh, get a, a feedback if it's really compliant uh, to the MISRA rules and if there are any lines of code that uh, are, uh, have some, some uh, faults in it. Or you use uh, the TPT tool that will bring up the behavior model, load the binary, and then uh, use the input data from this reference file to run the, um, the actual binary and compare the results so that you have a, a proof that it really works as expected or with a defined tolerance. And then finally, if your <laughs> all tests passed, then you will finally flush it under your ECU and, uh, and, and really run it. So all this can be done in an iterative uh, procedure, also uh, cross companies, cross departments, interdisciplinary. Uh, this is how the EFMU uh, workspace has been designed. And on top of that, we also, from the very beginning, said that we want an EFMU to look like an FMU. And that is for the purpose that if someone really has this software function and wants to use it in a software in the loop simulation scenario, then he should not, it should not be required that his tool supports EFMI. It should be sufficient that it supports FMI. And therefore, there's always the option to wrap the EFMU inside of an FMU, so that from the outside, it looks like just an FMU. And if you import it, there's really no difference. You run it. But the key thing is that it's executing your embedded code. And that makes it so special because you really know the code that is executed is the one that is supposed to run on my embedded device, but I run it in a, a software in the loop uh, scenario. And there's no additional license or enhancement or anything needed. 
are then having this uh, EFMU being wrapped as FMU. And that's also uh, a tool feature that we will see how you can easily do that. And yeah, this said, uh, we really open up a, a whole um, window or of opportunities where you can actually execute it and, uh, and how to execute it with this FMI wrapper. But also to mention is that by the fact that we have this uh, very transparent C code inside the EFMU, you can even create your own wrappers uh, reading the C code. So if you know what kind of interface your code generator is producing, then it's also rather straightforward, for instance, to import it into MATLAB or Simulink by using a C function uh, block or things like that. I mean, there's functionality provided also by other tools to, to support this, but that's also always an option uh, to kind of for a customized uh, workflow. Yeah, and then, of course, also um, other, uh, to support other existing standards that are around. So, yeah, this um, brings me to, um, to the end of, of my part, this more high-level view. Um, and I think what uh, will now be interesting to, to all of you to understand a little bit more in depth uh, what, how EFMI is designed. And uh, so Christoph, he has created some, some nice slides that shed some light onto how EFMI looks uh, inside. And um, um, well, I hand over later, or uh, you can take over now. Thank you, Oliver. So don't get confused with these slides. We jump into technical stuff, and the idea is that you just get a rough idea how EFMU looks on the technical side, so that you later understand what you will generate and the hands-on, uh, because you will investigate things to generate, right? So <clears throat> we have a EFMU, we have the EFMU manifest, where all the containers are listed, and there's this algorithm code. Well, <laughs> that is a very restricted type of program. It's not too incomplete. It is a sample data system, so it has a fixed sampling time. Uh, you can think at each sampling point, we execute a two-step method that tells us for these inputs, these are the new outputs. Um, and this language, it's imperative, target independent, and it has a high abstraction level, uh, level for math, so you can do multidimensional arithmetics, and you have all kind of uh, math functions in it. Um, but it has also uh, well-defined and decidable semantics that are safe. So uh, a lot of things you have to worry about if you would write C code, they are already handled here, like the order of evaluation and the numerics. Uh, you have a guaranteed error handling, so no errors can slip through. If you have a valid Gallic program, then the error is either handled or signaled. Uh, that's very important, so you cannot miss if anything goes wrong. Um, and of course, uh, it is well suited to then uh, tailor target C code for your target, right? If you have a multidimensional uh, operation, for example, then your production code container uh, can uh, optimize it for the target. How to compute, let's say, a matrix multiplication exactly. Um, so it's, it's essentially an intermediate presentation. You can think of it like a kind of LLVM, uh, but on a higher level for describing such sampled systems. Uh, and this is the starting point for the further EFMI tooling to generate no target code. And okay, that's a lot of stuff on the slide. Don't worry. You can uh, read it uh, later. You have all the slides with the software provided to you. But the main point is the algorithm code container consists of this uh, Gallic program, the algorithmic solution, plus the manifest, where you have all kind of meta information, like the interface, checksums for the uh, source files provided, documentation. You have IDs for later referencing from the other containers. You have things like uh, units, so you know which units your in and outputs have and your tunable parameters. 
And the other important, really important thing is we define here a common interface. So the common interface in EFMI is on the Gallic code level, not on the C code level. The C code level can look target specific, but here we define a common interface with what are my inputs, my outputs, tunable parameters, and the uh, sampling, recalibration, reinitialization methods uh, that you can call. So here the interface is uh, fixed and defined. Um, and we have what we call a block life cycle in the specification that now describes how you can system integrate this. And here you see this kind of linking, as you know also from FMI. So also in FMI you have, let's say, units, and then you can link from a variable to its uh, unit. It's the same kind of linking as you're used in FMI, only that in this case we also link back to the Gallic program, where the same thing must also exist. So the uh, XML manifest just an abstraction. And as I said, this is a starting point for any further code generation. So a production code generator has to read this Gully code. And this Gully comes with all these implicit language guarantees. So you know that, let's say, errors are handled. You know that every non-value that will pop up, you will be informed, so to speak, if any non-values pop up. <clears throat> The next container we have is the uh, behavior model container. So this one is again a CVS file, comma separated value file with the trajectories and plus the manifest with the meat information like checksums, documentation, it describes the scenarios, the tolerances that are accepted absolute and so on and the relative. And most importantly, it links the variables uh, to the algorithm code manifest and to the uh, comma separated value file. Because in each of these they could have different names, right? If you have a multi-dimension, let's say a matrix, it somehow has to be represented in the CV, uh, CSV file and uh, this is linked by the manifest, how to do that. So the behavior model features the documentation test scenarios in the manifest. Uh, it reuses the units from the algorithm code by linking to the algorithm code manifest. We have all kinds of tolerances, absolute, relative, and explicit upper and lower bounds that are listed as extra trajectories in the CSV file. Uh, we have two types of trajectories you can think of, uh, strictly sampled and unrestricted. Strictly means you have exactly a reference value point for each sampling, and unrestricted means that you have to do interpolation potentially. So you could use your continuous Modelica model and generate such a reference file, then you would be unrestricted, and if you use a Modelica synchronous sample, then you're restricted. And then we have the CSV file with further restrictions, like strictly monotone time trajectory, and the whole point of all of this is it has a unique interpretation. So a test tool can not just that one test tool says the test passes and the other tool says it doesn't pass, and that is because the one used a different interpolation. It's all defined in the standard how exactly to interpret such a uh, container, and for that reason there's only one way to interpret it if you run a test. Um, then you can link, that's the key, from the uh, behavior model to the algorithm code via such manifest references, and the whole point is that we have the variables listed. This way we link to the algorithm code variable uh, and we link to the CSV file. That is how things are connected via the manifests. Um, another container we have is a production code. These are just the C sources. Again, plus meter information. Again, checksums, documentation. Uh, the uh, global C entities are listed in the manifest. Uh, and you have again an, uh, a linkage from the C code to the Gallic code. So what this means, okay, is that um, the production code container, it's the documentation of the C sources, their dependencies are in the manifest, and the global entities. Um, that means uh, the C data layout itself is not standardized, but it is described in the production code manifest. So for that reason we can target different embedded environments, uh, and we link this whole manifest against the algorithm code manifest, uh, and this way we get how to interpret the production code for system integration, and how to actually use it. 
So if you think about it, we have uh, our algorithm code container and we have the production code container. And in the production code container, we let's say we have a global variable, then uh, its type is described in a manifest that may be, for example, a struct in C that holds the state of our controller. And then this may link back also to the algorithm code. And then we see, okay, our variable in the Gallic code is implemented in this C struct. It may also be completely different that it's a global variable, not a struct, and so on. But the point is, you get this link together, and then you know which part of your Gallic program is how implemented in the production code. <clears throat> and the last container is a binary. That is uh, maybe the most boring one. It just contains binaries, plus the manifests again. And in this case, the manifest describes things like the compiler flags, linker options, uh, how, did, how to compile this code, right? So, um, yeah, it's, it's a build receipt, uh, and it links to the production code container, so you know for which production code this is a binary code. And this is the catchy part for you. That's the part you should try to understand. How do you do testing now? If you think about it, it's like this. I have a behavior model container, and I have, let's say, a binary code container. And now I have to use this for testing. Then I can go via this indirect linking because my binary code container links to production code. The production code links to the algorithm code. My behavior model links to the algorithm code. And now I can match these two to know how to instantiate a test because the exact system integration depends on the target system. And this is the way you can instantiate it on the target system automatic via this indirect linking. Okay, that was a rough overview how these containers are connected and what their objectives are. You can take your time later, also the licenses of the software you got is valid until the end of the week. You can spend your evening and generate code and generate code and dig through all the resources and enjoy them. Um, but this was a general idea where you can start to try to understand what is generated there. Um, so, our claim is that EFMI is the standard for, uh, for model-driven development of advanced control functions for safety critical and real-time targets. And the idea is we provide you this container architecture with these different model representations. These different model representations are different abstraction levels, and this way we guide you from uh, algorithmic solution to binary code from implementation to testing. Um, and this enables you to do collaborative development. So there is not one person that develops an EFMU. You pass this EFMU like a development workspace around, and you have different tools and different players that work together to implement the functionality at the end. Um, you have the traceability and checksums. This uh, enables us to automatize the tool chain. So if something is changed in the container, we can see what are the stale artifacts and we can automatize it to regenerate. Uh, and we have the Gallic language, which gives us this uh, real-time safety guarantees. Uh, so we know that if our production code generator doesn't have a bug, then the C code it produces will satisfy uh, safety and real-time requirements. Um, even if other code analyzers tool would tell you this C code is not safe, because the only answer would be the production code generator has a bug. <clears throat> yeah. So they have two steps. The first is to find this algorithmic solution. That's not easy. For a Modelica tool, this is a very tough step to actually have the model and generate Gallic code. And once we are there, then EFMI conveys you further towards down the target. It's a rather simple standard. There are not many fancy features in it, um, particularly no opti optional features, but all the magic is essentially in the tools. The standard just describes uh, what has to be represented, but how to generate it, how to go from one step to the next, that's the magic in the tools. Uh, and the standard says nothing about it, how a tool does that, right? The standard t tells you nothing how to generate Gallic code. It says nothing how to generate production code. It just says this is how it has to look like. But how you get there is to the, up to the tool. Okay, this was the first part. 